I had a dream when I was 22 that someday I would go to the region of ice and snow and go on and on till I came to the one of the poles of the earth. This was Ernest Shackleton and this is the good, the bad and the pure evil. Born Ernest Henry Shackleton on February 15, 1874 in Kilkia in County Kildare in Ireland. His father was Henry and his mother was Henrietta. Ernest's father tried to join the British Army but due to poor health was denied so he became a farmer instead. Ernest was the second of ten children. His brother Frank became famous for the wrong reasons. He was a suspect of the 1907 robbery of the Irish Crown Jewels. Later he was exonerated and the jewels, they were never found. 1880, Ernest's father wanted a change in life. He gave up everything and moved the family to Dublin and began studying medicine in Trinity. Four years later, the family moved to the suburbs of London. It's believed the move was for work for Henry, who was now a qualified doctor, but the move could be down to the unease of Anglo-Irish ancestry after the killing of Lord Cavendish, the British Chief Secretary for Ireland in 1882. Ernest was always proud of his Irish roots and would confidently say he was an Irish man. From a child, Ernest loved to read. This love sparked a passion for adventure. Until the age of 11, he was taught by a governess. Then he went to preparatory school. Here, Ernest was described as being bored in school. His restlessness at school had him leave at 16, and he went to sea. He had a couple of options, Royal Navy Cadetship at Britannia, but Ernest couldn't afford this. So then there was the Mercantile Marine Cadet on Worcester and Conway. On the third option, an apprenticeship before the mast on a sailing vessel. The last one is what Ernest went for. His father got him a berth with the North Western Shipping Company aboard the square-rigged sailing ship called Houghton Tower. For four years at sea, Ernest learned the trade. He went to every corner of the planet and made friends with all kinds of people. In August 1894, Ernest passed the second mate exams and accepted a position as third officer on a tramp steamer of Welsh Shire Line. Two years later, in 1896, he got his first mate ticket, and then in 1898, he was a certified master mariner. This meant he could command a British ship anywhere in the world. 1898, Ernest joined Union Castle Line which was a mail and passenger carrier from Southampton to Cape Town. He was said to be not the usual type of officer. He was fine alone, but not a loner, and was a mix of sensitive and aggressive, but sympathetic. After the outbreak of the Boer War in 1899, Ernest moved to the troop ship, to troop ship Tingalgal to Castle. Here, in 1900s, he met Army Lieutenant Longstaff. His father was the money bags behind backing the National Antarctic Expedition. Ernest used his friendship to get an interview with Longstaff's father to try to get a place on the exhibition. Ernest impressed with his want and drive, so Longstaff Sr. recommended Ernest to Sir Markham the exhibition's head and Longstaff made it clear he wanted Ernest in. February 17, 1901, Ernest was appointed third officer to the exhibition ship Discovery. June 4, he was commissioned into the Royal Navy with sub-lieutenant rank in the Royal Nava Naval Reserves. He would take official leave from Union Castle and this would be the end of his merchant navy service. The Discovery Expedition, or British National Antarctic Ex 
exposition was the idea of Sir Clemens Markham. He was president of the Royal Geographical Society and had been planning this exhibition for years. The expedition was led by Robert Falcon Scott, who was a Royal Navy torpedo commander and had orders for scientific and geographical discovery. The discovery wasn't a naval unit, but Scott was a naval officer, so he wanted crew, officers and scientists who were used to that discipline, as the ship was run on Royal Navy lines. Ernest would accept the, these terms, even though he was used to a more laid-back leadership. Ernest's duties included seawater analysis, wardroom caterer, holes, stores, provisions, and to arrange onboard entertainment. The discovery left London July 31, 1901, and it arrived at the Antarctic coast January 8, 1902. When they arrived, Ernest took part in an ex experimental balloon flight on February 4th. Ernest went with scientists Edward Adrian Wilson and Hartley Ferrer on the first sledging trip from the winter quarters in McMurdo Sound. This journey created a safe route on the Great Ice Barrier. In the winter of 1902, while being confined by ice in the Discovery, Ernest edited the expedition's magazine called the South Polar Times. Clarence Hare, a steward, said Ernest was popular and a good mixer. Scott would pick Ernest to go with him and Wilson on an expedition south. A march southwards was done to achieve the highest possible latitude towards the South Pole. The march was a test more so than a serious attempt on the pole but it did gather great and important information for Scott. The fact Ernest was also involved shows Scott's trust in him. November 2nd, 1902, the party set off. The march was said by Scott as a success, but also a failure. They made a new latitude record of 82 degrees, 17 inches, but the journey had its issues. The dogs didn't perform well, their food had been tainted, and quickly they became sick. All 22 dogs died on the march, all of them. The three men, they had snow blindness, frostbite and scurvy. When Ernest got back he was said to have been broken down and couldn't continue his work. February 4th 1903, the party made it back to the ship. After being medically assessed, Scott sent Ernest home on the ship Morning, which arrived in McMurdo Sound. Some say Scott had Ernest removed out of jealousy. Ernest was a popular guy, and ill health was a good excuse to have him tossed. Ernest went to recover in New Zealand, and then returned to England. He was the first to return from Antarctic. So he was high demand, especially for consultations to rescue the discovery. He was given approval by Sir Markham to go on the Terra Nova ship for the second discovery relief operation. But Ernest turned it down. He did help equip equipping the Argentina Uruguay, which was a relief to the stranded Swedish Antarctic expedition. Ernest wanted a more secure and permanent job, so he applied for regular commission in the Royal Navy. He would try this using a backdoor route of the supplementary list. But even with the backing from Sir Markham and President of Royal Society, William Huggins, Ernest was not successful. So he became a journalist and he worked for the Royal Magazine, but wasn't really fulfilled. He got a secretaryship of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, or RSGS, and he started this January 11th, 1904. On April 9th, 1904, Ernest married Emily Doran. In 1905, Ernest became a shareholder in a company that was transporting Russian troops home from the Far East. 
Ernest was told it was sure money making thing, fortune making, guaranteed. Ernest told Emily of the unique idea and they would for sure get contracts, but nothing came from it, apart from debt. Ernest tried his hand at politics too. 1906 he stood in the general elect elections in Dundee as a liberal unionist, but that didn't pan out either. So he took a job with industrialist William Be uh, Birdmore. Later he'd be known as Lord Inverney. Anyway, Ernest took a job with him with a roving commission that involved interviewing prospect clients and entertaining business friends of Beardmore. But again, Ernest wasn't happy with life. He yearned to go back to Antarctic and made it known this was his goal with his own expedition. Beardmore was impressed with Ernest and offered him funds, but Ernest needed more and loans and donations Ernest found hard to secure. Ernest still pressed on, and in February 1907, he presented his plans for an Antarctic expedition to the Royal Geographical Society. It would be detailed at this, as the British Antarctic Expedition, and was published in the Royal Geographical Society's newsletter called Geographical Journal. The aim was to conquer the South Pole and Site Magnetic Pole. Ernest then went off for money. He spoke to any wealthy friends he had. Sir Philip Lee Brocklehurst gave £2,000, or over £200,000 today, for a spot on the expedition. The author Campbell Mackella also gave money. And Guinness, the Irish dry, dry state, while well, Guinness Baron Lord Ivan his contribution was added just two weeks before they departed. The expedition ship was called Nimrod. January 1st, 1908, the Nimrod set off from New Zealand. Ernest wanted to use the old discovery base in McMurdo Sound to launch his attempts on the poles. But Scott, he didn't want that, claiming it as his own field of work. So to keep the peace, Ernest looked for a different winter quarters at the Barrier Inlet or King Edward VII's land. To keep coal used down, the ship was towed over 2,500 kilometres to the Antarctic ice. After Ernest had persuaded New Zealand and Union Ste uh, Steamship Company to share the coast, the Nimrod headed for the Great Ir Ice Barrier getting there on January 21st, 1908. They found the barrier inlet had now become a large bay with hundreds of whales. This had them call it the Bay of Whales. They described the ice as unstable, which caused issues to set up base. So they extended a search for Anchorage at King Edward VII land, but this was just as bad. So Ernest had no choice. He had to go back on the agreement with Scott and headed for McMurdo Sound. Second officer Arthur Harbord said it was common sense. The ice was bad and coal was short and they weren't aware of any closer bases. The Nimrod arrived at McMurdo Sound on January 29th but I stopped them about 26 kilometers north of Discovery's old base at Hut Point. Weather delayed them, but eventually they set base at Cape Royds. Despite the issues, the party was excited. Ernest had kept them up to date with what was going on. So this had the men not only happy, but also focused. October 29, 1908, the Great Southern Journey, as the English explorer Frank Wilde called it, set off. By January 9, 1909, Ernest Wilde, British Army Doctor Eric Marshall and British Antarctic explorer Jemson Adams reached a new record just 180 kilometres from the pole. 
While on the journey, they discovered Birdmore Glass uh, Glacier, which they named after Ernest's patron, and the four became the first to not only see but travel under sight polar plateau. The journey, though, had issues. Returning was a race against starvation as rations were low. Frank Wilde became extremely ill and noticed Ernest noted Ernest giving him his one biscuit a day to him. In his diary, Wilde said, quote, All the money that was ever minted would not have bought that biscuit, and that remembrance of that sacrifice will never leave me. End quote. The men just got back in time to Hut Point for to catch the ship. The exhibition also had the first ascent of Mount Erebus and the discovery of the rough location of the site magnetic pole on January 16, 1909. Ernest came back to the UK a hero and went on to publish his account, to publish his account entitled Heart of the Antarctic. Public honours came quickly once he returned. King Edward VII received Ernest July 10th and made him a knight, having him Sir Ernest Shackleton. Ernest was also honoured by the Royal Geographical Society with a gold medal. All members, including Ernest of the Nimrod, got silver polar medals on November 23rd. Ernest was also appointed younger brother of Trinity House. Outside official honours, Ernest was greeted with huge public excitement. Reality though, Ernest was in serious debt from the expedition. He owed a lot of money to many people. He did try repay, but in the end, the government had to step in with a grant of £20,000 or £1.5 million today to help clear these debts and some deaths had to be written off. Instant celebrity had Ernest at public appearances, giving lectures and attending social engagements. He wanted to cash in on his newfound fame, so he looked at ventures like a tobacco company, a scheme to sell collector stamps, and the development of a Hungarian mining concession. None of these were great, so he made his money from lecture tours. But again, that itch came to go back to the site. To get back would depend on how Scott's Terra Nova expedition got on. It left Cardiff July 1910. By 1912, the pole was conquered by Norwegian Roald Amundsen. As for Scott's expedition, it was unknown. Ernest set his sights on explorers William Spears Bruce's abandoned project for a continental crossing from Waddell Sea to McMurdo Sound. Bruce couldn't get the money, so Ernest adapted the plan. Early 1914, Ernest published details for his new expedition called Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. Two ships were needed. Endurance would have the main party from Waddell Sea. Then a sixth team, led by Ernest, would start to cross. The second ship would be Aurora. Aurora would take another party under Captain McIntosh to Murdo Sound on the other side of the continent. Their job was to lay supplies across the Great Ice Barrier to Birdmore Glacier. The supplies had food and fuel and would give Ernest's party the chance to complete the 2900 kilometer journey. Ernest did fundraising before going and got £10,000, about a million today from the government, £24,000 from Scottish jute baron Sir James Card, and industrialist Frank Dudley Decker gave £10,000, and a generous sum came from the tobacco heiress Janet Stancombe Willis. Public interest was huge this time round, with 5,000 applications to join. Ernest's interfering method was odd. It wasn't your technical ability he was offered, 
but your character and temper. He'd ask weird questions like if you'd like to sing, if you could sing, and if you were any good. And some he asked nothing at all, just hired them from appearances only. He also was a bit loose on roles. Everyone did the chores, from the officers, scientists and seamen. Ernest socialised with the crew, had dinner with them, sang songs with them, told jokes and played games. Eventually he selected a 56 crew, 28 for each ship. World War I broke out on August 3rd, 1914. The First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, told the endurance to go ahead, so it left on August 8th. Ernest O didn't leave until September 27th, meeting the ship in Buenos Aires. So the crew, Ernest led the expedition. The endurance was captained by F. Worsley, and the Aurora had J. Stenhouse. The endurance second in command was Frank Wilde. Meteorologist was L. Hussey, and head of scientific staff was McElroy. Alexander Macklin was a surgeon on board who kept the 70 dogs healthy. Tom Crenn, an Irish seaman, was the dog's handler. There also was a stowaway. Pierce Blackborough, a Welsh sailor, was found on board. Ernest was not happy about this, but couldn't be seen to turn back, so Blackborough was made a steward. Injuras left South Georgia on December 5th for Waddell Sea and then headed for Vassell Bay. The ship headed southward, navigating in the ice. They then hit first year ice slowing their progress. In the Waddell Sea, it wasn't good and was getting worse. January 19, 1915, the endurance became frozen in an ice floe or drift ice. They were trapped until the next spring. Ernest ordered abandonment of ship's routine and to change to a winter station. The endurance drifted slowly north amongst the ice for months. September brought the spring and the ice broke and moved but this had huge pressure on the hull. Before this, Ernest hoped when the ship released, they could go back on track to Fasel Bay. But October 24th, water started to pour into the ship. Days later, Ernest ordered to abandon ship. Men, provisions and equipment moved to camps on the ice. November 21st, 1915, the ship sunk below the surface, gone. For two months, Ernest and crew camped on large flat flow, praying it would drift to Paulette Island, about 400 kilometers away. Marches across the ice to the island failed, so Ernest set a more permanent camp called, Pata called Patience Camp. They trusted the drift would hopefully take them to safety. March 17th, their ice camp was just 95 kilometers from Paulette Island, but with impassable ice, they couldn't reach land. April 9th, the ice flow they were on snapped in two. Panic erupted and Ernest ordered the crew into lifeboats to head for the nearest land. Five long and tough days at sea, the exhausted men landed their three lifeboats at Elephant Island. This was the first time in 497 days that the men stood on solid land. Ernest would be more concerned for his crew than himself and even gave his mitts away to a crew member. This had Ernest's fingers frostbitten. March 9, 2022, the endurance was found four miles from where it was said to have been lost and was 10,000 feet below surface. Elephant Island sounds lovely, but it's not. No one lives there. It's cold, icy and rocky. It's far from any shipping routes and chances of rescue or being found were zero. 
So Arnas made a decision to risk a journey on an open boat to try reach South Georgia whaling stations, where he knew help would lie. Ernest chose the strongest of the tiny lifeboats. They named it James Card after a sponsor. The ship's carpenter, Harry McNeish, improved the boat. He raised the sides, strengthened the keel, built the deck and canvas, and sealed the work with oil paint and seal blood. For the journey, it was Ernest, Frank Worsley, who had navigation skills, Tom Crane, who begged to go, sailors John Vincent and Timothy McCarty, and the carpenter, Harry McNeish. McNeish and Ernest had a bit of a spat when they were on the ice. Ernest wouldn't forget it, but he knew McNeish's value, so he took him. The team took enough supplies for four weeks. Ernest reckoned if they didn't make it by then, they had gotten lost. James Card launched April 24, 1916. For 15 days, it sailed through waters with storms and threats of capsizing. May 8, with Worsley's navigation, the cliffs of South Georgia appeared, but hurricane winds had them hang out of shore with constant danger of being bashed into the rocks. The next day, they finally made land on the unoccupied southern shore. They rested and decided to try a land crossing. For the journey, they had boots with screws as a makeshift climbing boot, a carpenter's oats, which is a utility tool, and 50 feet of rope. Ernest travelled 50 kilometres with Worsley and Crean over dangerous terrain for 36 hours to get to the whaling station at Stromness on May 20th. Ernest sent a boat immediately to get the men on the south side and to set to work to get rescue to those on Elephant Island. His first three tries were blocked by sea ice. He called for help from the Chilean government who gave him the small tug Yelchio. Yelchio and the British whaler Southern Sky got to Elephant Island on August 30th, 1916. At that point, the men on the island were there four and a half months. Ernest immediately had them all evacuated. When he returned to England in May 1917, World War I was happening. Ernest had a heart condition which was made worse by his adventures. He also was too old to conscript, but he did volunteer for the army. He started to drink heavily. October 1917, he was sent to Buenos Aires to boost British propaganda. Unqualified as a diplomat, he couldn't persuade Argentina or Chile to get into the war on the Allied side. April 1918, Ernest returned home. Ernest then got involved in a mission to Spitsbergen. It was to establish a British presence under the illusion of a mining operation. On the way, Ernest took sick, appointed to a military expedition to Marmaksk, suggested he should go home before he left for North Russia. But July 22nd, 1918, Ernest was specially appointed, although only temporary, to Major. From October, he served with the North Russia Expeditionary Force in the Russian Civil War, with the role advising on equipment and training of British forces in Arctic conditions. Ernest was appointed an officer of the Order of the British Empire in 1919. He came back to England in March 1919, full of plans regarding North Russia. But his plans were squashed when the Bolshevik took control. October 1919, he was discharged from the army. So after discharge, Ernest went back to lectures and published his endurance story called South in December 1919. 1926, he became bored with the lectures 
and started a dream of one last expedition. Ernest thought serious about the Bulford Sea in the Arctic, a huge unexplored area and it even piqued interest in the Canadian government. Ernest got funds from a school friend John Quiller Rowett and was able to get a 125 ton Norwegian sealer called Foka 1. Ernest wasn't keen on the name so he called it Quest. The plan changed to the Antarctic. Ernest said it was a project for ocean oceanographic and sub-Antarctic expedition. Goals weren't very precise, but it seemed to be going around the Antarctic, investigating islands that were considered lost, like Tuaniki. Rowett paid for the full expedition, which had it known as Shackleton Rowett Expedition. The expedition left England September 24, 1921. Former endurance crews signed up for the Quest expedition. When they got to Rio de, uh, de Janeiro, Ernest had what was thought to be a heart attack. But Ernest wouldn't delay with a medical exam, so the quest continued. January 4th, 1922, they reached South Georgia. The next morning, Ernest called the expedition's doctor, Alexander Macklin. Ernest was in pain, particularly with his back. Macklin advised rest and to give up alcohol. Minutes later, at 2.50 a.m., Ernest Shackleton had a fatal heart attack and died on January 5th, 1922. Ernest's wife, Emily, requested Ernest to be buried in South Georgia. March 5th, 1922, he was buried as requested by Emily. His will was proven in London, May 12th, 1922. He died in huge debt with a small estate of 550 pounds, or about 32,000 pounds, left to Emily. November 27, 2011, ashes of Frank Wilde were placed at the right-hand side of Ernest's grave, with the inscription, Frank Wilde, 1873, to 1939, Shackleton's right-hand man. I think this is as the boss would have had it himself, standing lonely in an island far from civilization, surrounded by stormy, tempestuous seas, and in the vicinity of one of his greatest exploits, Alexander Macklin, a diary entry. And that is Ernest Shackleton's story. Like and subscribe to my YouTube and podcast and join me next time for the story of the transatlantic slave trade. It transported 10 to 12 million enslaved Africans across the Atlantic to America from the 16th to the 19th century. By the 19th century, governments acted to ban the trade but illegal smuggling still continued. Until then, this was the good, the bad and the pure evil.